Professor Inika Sleiter, anchoring the radical new, the case of Socrates. Thank you so much, Don. And I've already seen a number of familiar names in the list of participants. I can't see all of you, but it's a great pleasure to be with you today. Um, yes, I'm going to talk about Socrates since he's the topic of your whole colloquium, but I will be doing it uh, as Don was intimating from the perspective of a particular research program by a group of Dutch classicists. And in fact, what we're studying is a very familiar classical conundrum. We just do it in slightly different terms. So we think about the new and the old, about tradition and originality, about conservatism versus innovation and progress, but as I said, in new terms. And so the question that I'm going to try and answer today is not a philosophical one, but one of cultural history and maybe one of cognition, because that's something that uh, interests me very much. And that means that the best that I can hope for for you today is that I will group a number of, I'm afraid, very familiar features in Plato's portrait of Socrates in a slightly new way and under a new lens. Because as we know, Plato right. was facing a particular challenge um, as constructed in Plato's portrait, so Socrates is a unique mm -hmm. figure who had to be both completely new, radically new, different from all that had gone before. This is, this is something that Plato is constructing. Um, he takes a, a new form of ideal manhood and embodies it. He's a new type of philosopher, maybe, according to Plato. But as I will argue, the radically new still needs to be accommodated by the relevant social groups. And in this case, that would be Plato's audience, but he's been so successful that it has included the centuries after and also ourselves. So the question is, how is this achieved? I will be sharing my screen for the handout and just talk you through it. So that research project that I was referring to, the program, is called Anchoring Innovation. And it actually started from an observation that was made in a, in a non-academic context that our government tended to talk a lot about innovation. It's a very trendy word. Uh, but what we observed is that our society tends to delegate the whole issue of innovation, innovation to the sciences, technology, the medical sciences, and don't get me wrong, they find out a lot of new things, but what they tended to completely elide is the human factor in all of this. Not completely, but it's usually taken in as an afterthought, and that in itself is a bad thing. And so there were two things that irritated us frankly, about this way of approaching innovation. One is that as humanity scholar and as the social scientists that we like to collaborate with, we just know that, that innovation is not restricted to those areas, but that you can innovate almost anything, including literature, the arts, politics, religion, philosophy, um, education, you just name it, all the domains of society in and of itself lend themselves to forms of innovation. That was one thing. And the second part, so we wanted to basically show that. Second thing is that human factor. You can invent whatever you want, but unless you manage to, um, to realize that there are social groups out there that need to recognize what you have just proposed to them that must be able to accommodate it to their worldview, um, and just cognitively to, to uh, embrace it, yeah, uh, inventions will fa fail and they will never make it into uh, ad adopted innovation. That's how we define innovation. Um, so you can find some more information about the whole program on our website, which I've mentioned there under number one on the handout. And there's also an overview of the principles of the program uh, in a paper that is available in open access in the European Review. Now, 
the interesting thing when we begin to look at the, the Greeks and the Roman world is that actually the new has had a lot of attention lately. I just mentioned two books here under three. There's the book by Armand Dangour, The Greeks and the New, Novelty in, ancient, in the Ancient Greek Imagination and Experience. Also a very interesting book by Patricia Ingham, The Medieval New, uh, again, clearly meant to be paradoxical, but very convincingly argued. This is not a period of standstill, but uh, quite to the, con uh, to the contrary. There's all kinds of new things going on. Uh, Dongur lists all the points in, in which particularly the Periclean Athens was uh, an area of radical innovation. Almost everything was new. Uh, the way the economy was organized with the use of coin, uh, extensive use of coin mo money, not invented there, but used uh, on a large scale. This is, of course, all Athens. A huge building program, so the material world changed, changes in the theater, the invention of drama, uh, the invention of the large scale structures that are needed to have people watch drama, the political changes going on in the Athenian democracy. He sees an era of great novelty and actually a willingness to explore that. And that in itself seems to contradict something that I also have been brought up with, which is the notion that the Greeks in particular and the Athenians, of course, as our main source material are in the grip of the past. It's the title of an essay, a 1953 essay by Van Groningen, who's actually one of my predecessors in Leiden. And that in the, in the grip of the past has a certain attraction to it. I mean, you don't have to read very widely to see that there is continuous reference to the Trojan War and mythology and uh, the ancestors and and so this was going on, visibly going on, all this being in the grip of the past, in the midst of all this novelty that attra had attracted a little bit less attention for a while. And Dangur is quite radical about it. He says, so I've now collected all this material about the new, and that shows that Van Groningen is wrong. The Greeks were not in the grip of the past because they're radical innovators. Uh, the group that I've been working with takes a different approach. We suspect that what looks like the grip of the past is actually one of the ways, one of the forms that anchoring innovation can take. And anchoring is the concept that we use for what I was describing just now, taking the human factor into account. What makes it possible for people to accommodate the new? What presents itself as new to them, it's uh, very frequently a matter of social construction. How can they connect that to something that they recognize as familiar? And this process of anchoring, whether it's a conscious process, whether you can indicate agents or whether it's just something that we observe happening is necessary for the successful accommodation of the new. And the grip of the past may be one of the forms that it takes. So you see something new, but you refer to something very familiar as a cultural paradigm. I've uh, given a, a kind of a shorthand definition of anchoring under number five. It's a form of connecting, whether you do it yourself or someone does it for you, or whether someone tries to manipulate you in it, that's also uh, an issue. You, uh, it is connecting what presents itself as new to what is perceived as familiar. And we study that not on an individual level, but to the extent that we can for the relevant social groups. And those may be very different groups. Um, as we know, society is not monolithic. So something that is acceptable in a certain way for one social group may not be acceptable to another group. Uh, it's very important to realize that the new and the old are not just descriptive labels, objective descriptors, they're not. Um, they uh, are, are um, uh, constructed and also they are value laden. 
And again, that may be different for different groups and for different domains. So for instance, if I have a five-year-old, maybe not even smart phone, that is ridiculous. In the, in the area of technology, the old is, is um, identified with the obsolete, the, the archaic. It's, that's not a positive value. Um, if you're a notary public, the old tried and tested ways of working are highly valued. So it's different for different areas. Um, if you're an antique seller, old is better than new, right? So you have to realize that you're not thinking about objective, um, uh, descriptive labels. You can anchor in different ways. You can make a positive connection uh, of one thing to another. You have to do with forms of analogical thinking which uh, according to Douglas Hofstetter is the most basic cognitive operation we have anyway. We think through analogical thinking. You can also anchor uh, negatively by saying what something is not. You use something as a foil and offset yourself against it. We use the terms horizontal and vertical anchoring to make it clear that um, it's not always about the grip of the past. Vertical anchoring may be um, the case when you're connecting what we have now to something in the past, that's vertical. But you can also uh, anchor within the same society in the same period, just to another domain. Um, so you may say that um, a certain type of drone is like a flying computer from one domain to the next, but not to the past necessarily. And there's very different ways of doing it. You can use more than one anchor. You can use the same anchor to anchor multiple things. It is a very flexible and dynamic system. And something that necessitated, that, that made it necessary to be anchored uh, on first invention may later on be so familiar that it is, uh, it can be used to anchor other things. Coinage is actually a good example. Uh, initially, it may have borne the Athenian owl and, and uh, an image of the goddess Athena to make the Athenians realize this is our money. We had to anchor the new coinage. Uh, but these days, I live in a monarchy. Every time we get a new one, they get to be on our coins. This is not because the coins need to be anchored, but because the new king or queen needs to be anchored. So you see that this is a, a, a dynamic system. And you can anchor both visually, which I will not be paying a lot of attention to, apart from two examples, uh, and most effectively maybe, but then I'm a language person, in discourse, in various forms of discourse. And an example of that is actually what happens when a new cultural phenomenon is being introduced. For instance, and there's a wonderful paper by Goldwasser, What is a Horse? the lexical acculturation and classification of a horse. So there's the, the new animal, they didn't have it, and they had to give it a name. And uh, they do that in different ways, in Egyptian, Sumerian, and Nahuati. Um, and one way to do it is to say that a horse is a donkey of the mountain. So the donkey was familiar, you add a qualifier to it, and that helps you to acculturate. To, to make cultural room for the new, the new animal. It's not a brand new animal. It is perceived as something new, like I was saying before. So here's an example of visual anchoring. Uh, this is always a, an example that intrigues me. This is a, actually an electric car. And we see someone here who is recharging the battery of that car. However, I actually wonder whether that is what we perceive when we look at this holistically. By now, maybe we do. We're more, more used to electric cars than we were when they were first introduced. That's the whole uh, point, actually, of the story. The first owners of electric cars had to know what to do with the uh, darn thing, right? They had batteries that needed to be recharged. Basically, that comes down to plugging the car into an electric outlet. But look at the way all this has been shaped. The socket on the car, it's a socket, can be anywhere. 
because there's no connection to a fuel tank. But certainly in the first generation of electric cars, I notice now I'm I've taken to noticing electric cars for the, for this reason. It's all for research purposes. So in that first generation, the socket was in the exact same place where the tank used to be. And the whole process of recharging the battery is, uh, as it were, anchored in familiar procedures and visual cues that are all connected to taking fuel. So look at the way the pump is shaped. It's not a pump, by the way. Look at the nozzle, which really is a plug. So even the language gets a little bit confused. Look at the tube, which is not a tube, which leads from the pump to the nozzle. So it just ineluctably evokes familiar and traditional forms and procedures. This, of course, is a matter of clever design because designers know, without having studied our texts, that you need to anchor these things. The procedure looks familiar. So um, people know what to do. It is stylized at the same time to look hip and new. This is a very successful design move. And that electric car is also good for bringing home another crucial point, the descriptive label issue, uh, because these cars weren't new. We thought they were though, but when uh, cars were first being designed and invented, there was competition between the combustion engine and the electrical one. It was there all along, but it was just very impractical uh, because the uh, radius, the action radius was rather limited and there was no way at the time to organize recharging stations at regular intervals. So the pull factor was on the side of the fuel-based engines and there was no push factor of wanting to protect the environment when the car was first being invented. So the combustion engine won and the electric car was forgotten until it was revived under different social cultural circumstances and then was readily accepted as new uh, because it's technology and so it's a desirable kind of novelty. Oops, excuse me. Well, I'm not an art historian, but I would like to point uh, to uh, draw your attention to a very attractive paper by Catoni and Giuliani on visually anchoring Socrates, although of course they don't use that term. They wonder why does Socrates look like a satyr in his portraits and in the statues? And I'll show you just one of them, rather satyr-like. Uh, they make a very attractive um, uh, argument about that. They uh, say, well, it's very hard to know what he actually looked like. And it's also likely that the memory of his physical appearance would have disappeared rather quickly. It would have faded. There were no pictures uh, or anything. Uh, and they study the two types, the two series of Socratic portraits, Roman copies, all of them, of course. And they decide that this type, um, when, although it's younger, the, the Roman series is younger, was actually an older Athenian type. And their argument is, they also say, you know, if you look at, at Aristophanes' clouds, it is just not very likely that there was a, an emphatic satyr-like or Silenus-like look to him. He certainly wasn't wearing a satyr mask, which would have belonged to a different, uh, a different genre anyway, but absolutely no attention is drawn to his uh, the way he looked. And if it's so distinctive, that would have been such a missed opportunity. And this is contemporary. Socrates was very much alike, alive when that play was, um, was performed. So they say this uh, portrait may have been uh, ordered by Socrates' followers, by people who thought well of them, maybe before he was fully rehabilitated. There is also some speculation in that paper, but that's all right. Uh, and they thought there may have been an apologetic purpose to it. He is portrayed as different from anyone else. And they bring in a text from uh, the symposium, which you will be familiar with. 
where it is um, stated that he is not like. Um, he's not like anyone to the Medeni Anthropon Homoion Aenai. Not of the people uh, that went before, not of the present ones. That's really a, a thing that's worthy of a lot of surprise. Achilles, okay, there's a Brasidas. Pericles, well, there's a Nestor and Antenor. Look that the direction is inverted in these two. Achilles is the old one, Brasidas the recent one. Uh, Pericles is the new one, Nestor and Antenor are, of course, the Homeric examples. But for Socrates, there's just Atopia. There's a, a, a sort of absurdity. You can't place him. So if he's like none of the human beings, maybe it's the Silenoi and the satyrs. So there's a, there's a discourse going on about this that may have been, that may have led to a certain representation in the portraiture. So it's a, a kind of inversion of what we tend to think. He is atopos, he is daimonios, like a satyr. So I will not go into the details of their argument here. This is also a little outside of my area of competence. But what it emphasizes is that a Socratic uniqueness was emphasized. The portraits are indeed not the typical uh, philosopher portraits. It's just in a category of its own. But for the rest of this talk, I'll be focusing on this. And what I would like to point out, because um, it's striking once you start looking at this, is that a number of the ologies that we know, mythology, genealogy, etiology, etymology, are often take narrative forms, and they are all very suitable to connecting the status quo. They're usually designed to uh, explain the status quo. Uh, can you still hear me? I'm just checking because I'm getting a warning that my connection is unstable. Don, can you still hear me? Yes, you're fine. OK, fine, good. Um, so these are, these are forms of discourse that are, are used to, to explain something about the status quo usually. That's also a function of mythology, genealogy, anchors, uh, a, a current situation in a significant point in the past. And there it stops. It usually doesn't go all the way back. Uh, etiology, so an explanation of something that offers itself in our situation. And ancient etymology is very much uh, um, meant to explain something that we have and to explain the reason why something is called what it is called. And skipping the next thing, there are many ways in which Socrates can be connected to all kinds of things, also to animals, stingrays, horseflies. Um, and I will now turn to the way this radically new figure, this figure that Plato wants to describe as unlike anything, um, is actually anchored in his portrait of Socrates. And of course, the main thing that he uses for that, the instrument that he uses, is to offset Socrates against the sophists. And I'm not telling any, I'm not pretending to be new here, um, but I'm just framing it in terms of negative anchoring here. And in fact, if you look into the matter, the only real differences may have been that Socrates never moved from Athens and the sophists were traveling. And obviously the fact that for the sophists, this was a way to make a living. And for Socrates, it was about a way of life. That's not an unimportant difference, uh, by the way. But the difference is also marked by different modes of discourse, questioning versus lecturing or show speeches. The knowledge worker without knowledge versus the professors who profess to know and to share their knowledge for money. And as I said, philosophy as a way of life rather than a source of income. In these three ways, Socrates is new and markedly different. There has never been anyone before who would work in the questioning mode, who would say, I'm, I don't know anything myself, uh, or who would describe 
philosophy as a way of life, something that you have to do. And apart from the negative anchoring, all three of these also have positive anchoring. And if you put them together like this, the striking thing is that in these three cases, Plato goes back to very strong markers in the Greek cultural imagination, because he goes back to the Delphic Oracle, to the, the phenomenon of the family business, which can also be connected to genealogy, the regular succession of generations. In Greek cultural imagination, a very, very strong presence, genealogical thinking, going right back to uh, Hesiod, obviously. And the third one, and maybe the most surprising one, is uh, the anchor used for philosophy as a way of life, is Homer. And um, the way in which Socrates is presented as the successor in a better way to both Achilles and Odysseus, and I will be spending most of the time on that. But let me just quickly say something about the Delphic Oracle and the family business, uh, briefest of all about the Delphic Oracle. Yeah. This just initiates the whole uh, questioning uh, journey of, um, of Socrates, the familiar nobody is wiser oracle. Um, Socrates starts his search in order to disprove it, continues it in honor of the god, uh, keeps on investigating the truth of the oracle. So this is an anchor in Greek religious thought. Delphi can be much stronger than that. And obviously, it also serves an apologetic purpose, like that, that portrait that I showed just now. And in fact, almost everything else that uh, is part of the Socratic por portrait, the, the apology um, is stronger than almost everything. The family business uh, is something that has uh, entertained me more and more, obviously. The knowledge worker without knowledge uh, occurs maybe most strongly in the story in the Theaetetus, where Socrates is talking to Theaetetus. And I was looking back at the very beginning of that whole story about midwifery, because it's the introduction that is, is actually wonderful. So uh, Theaetetus has just been saying that he isn't getting much further and Socrates says, well, you know, it's no wonder you're getting stuck. You experience birth pangs, Odinaisgar. That must have been a profoundly astonishing remark at this point. It isn't anchored to anything. It's out of the blue, he tells this young man, you're pregnant, and Kumo. And I also really love Theaetetus reply, Oida or Socrates. Not so sure. I'm not even entirely sure how to read it. I'm now translating it, not so sure, uh, Socrates. So maybe just genu genuine puzzlement. I don't know, but I'm not entirely sure what it, what it means. So Socrates takes a step back and he says, well, haven't you heard that I'm the son of a midwife? A very good one. Yeah. I've heard, I've heard that one, tout or que, at least that, that bit is familiar. Well, have you also heard that I uh, practice the same techne? No. Well, but that's the case. So don't give me away to the others, for it has escaped. Notice that I have that techne. And because they don't know that, they don't say that about me, but that I am atopotatos. Here we go again. Here's Socratic atopia, the thing that makes him absurd in everyone's eyes. But now there's an anchor. There's an anchor. He's doing the same thing as his mother, as so many Greeks would have been in the business of usually their fathers, um, or you know would have resembled their parents in other ways. There are many passages where uh, the, the the discourse is about children resembling their parents. And that's a very reassuring idea. There are curses that say, if you, if I don't abide by this, may we have, may our polis have children that do not resemble their parents, which means that something is profoundly amiss in that situation. Okay, so these are the first two, the Delphic Oracle and the family business. <clears throat> now, for Homer, 
and philosophy as a way of life. There are several slightly older books about Plato and the hero, courage, manliness. This is uh, Angela Hobbes, Etienne Smouche, Le Courage chez les Grecs. Um, Le Courage, it's actually <coughs> unfortunate that he put that in the title because obviously all of this is about manliness, the way to be a good man, an ideal man, even. I also put the title of uh, Ryan Ballard's more recent book in their courage in the democratic polis, but it's actually about constructions of manliness and ideal manhood that are important here. Well, the thing that strikes one if you look at this is uh, how important Achilles is to Socrates. In the Apology, um, he, he uh, talks about an imaginary critic who is blaming Socrates for putting himself at shameful risk of an ignominious death because of his own activities. This is handout number 18. Socrates rejects this and says, by your line of reasoning, toi gesoi, logoi, all the heroes who died before Troy would be despicable, just because they died actually, fauloi including notably the son of Thetis. Here he is, Achilles. Um, the text actually continues, I skipped a little bit in the handout, but he had such contempt for the danger of death. And there's always this play on uh, kindunos, which is also the word of course for a trial, but it's also a signal word to evoke the context of ombreia, courage, manliness, um, inseparable in Greek. Uh, he had such contempt for the danger of death, as long as he could avoid this grace, that not even his mother, a goddess, could warn him off by saying, if you will take revenge for Patroclus, you too will die. And in response, Achilles said, well, may I die on the spot. Once I've punished the wrongdoer, I will not be a living laughingstock. And then the last bit is on the handout again. You wouldn't think, would you, that he cared about the danger of death. So um, Socrates is here explicitly taking um, Achilles as a model. But we may not even think that is totally strange. It's not the only case either. A similar thing is happening in the Crito, uh, where the context is the question, how quickly will Socrates have to die? Crito reports the arrival of the ship, he thinks it will arrive that same day so that Socrates will have to die tomorrow. But Socrates doesn't think so because he had a dream. And this is the dream I dreamt. Uh, handout number 19. I dreamt that a beautiful woman of exquisite stature approached me. She was wearing white clothes. She called me and said, Socrates, on the third day, you will reach Phthia, which with its rich soil. Obviously, Achilles' homeland. Achilles uses these words in a slightly different form in the first person uh, when he is rejecting the embassy from Agamemnon. So it's in book nine. The interpretation of this dream is that Socrates will not die tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow. Achilles will reach his homeland, Socrates will come home in death. Hobbes remarks that uh, Achilles wasn't doing something very honorable in this particular passage, whereas obviously uh, Socrates is thought to do so. Um, and for Socrates, home is not simply a place on earth. So it's a, it's a value laden quotation, but it also means that uh, again, Socrates sees himself in, um, in Achilles shoes. And Achilles, obviously, is a prototype of Andrea, which means that uh, it is the kind of example that people come up with particularly quickly. Uh, if you put him in a, in a list with other men, he would score higher uh, on the, 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 the characteristic of Andrea. Achilles is a real man. The book by uh, Smoos that I mentioned earlier shows a, a progression in 
Greek thought where the ideal man is first represented by Achilles, then it becomes a hoplite, and then Plato takes over and it becomes a philosopher. General Lachis, where, uh, in whose dialogue Andrea is central, being a, a man, a real man, is staying in one's position. And taxai, this is not on your handout, and taxai menein, and not fleeing. That's actually a good one for hoplites, and taxai menein. But the step to Socrates is also not too hard to take. And the texts that I'm now going to quote are right are following right on the previous one um, from the apology. So I'm in text number 20. Um, this is the truth of the matter, he says, gentlemen of the jury. Whenever a man has taken a position that he believes this one, uh, take this one, to be best, or has been placed by his commander, there he must, I think, remain and face danger without a thought for death or anything else rather than disgrace. So you see, again, the same words, uh, taxai, tachtai, so it's the same, uh, it's the same tatain uh, vocabulary, menonta uh, so standing your ground and facing the danger, not being afraid of, uh, of death. So here, this same language of Andrea is applied to the situation in court. And right after this, Socrates refers to his role in the battles of Potidaia, Amphipolis, and Delium. It would have been bizarre, he says, if he had remained uh, on his post in those battles. This is text uh, uh, 21. But be a deserter now, although in this case, it is the God who is his commanding officer, because it's the God who ordered him to Philosophize. And here we go in the direction of uh, philosophy as a way of life. Now, any other Athenian would definitely also have referred to their military service when facing a court of law. That was just one of the top boy that you could go through and win the sympathy of your, of your uh, fellow townsmen. And that is what Socrates is doing here. So it's a good rhetorical move. But in this case, the military expeditions are part of an a fortiori argument. They are simply there to show that if he managed to do the right and responsible thing for his human elected commanders, he could not possibly become a deserter now when a god has the command. And lipotaxis, that was a crime actually. So here you have Andrea in a martial context, first cued by Achilles, now in the service of the higher goal of philosophy, philosophy as a way of life, because the real Andreas Aner is a philosopher. In the symposium, I'm now turning to um, texts 22 and following, Alcibiades also makes extensive use of military language. In this case, mostly, to describe his military um, operation to seduce Socrates. He says, I decided I had to attack the man, Epitheteon, and not give up, Kai Up on Eteon. But of course, this bastion of Sophosune, Andrea, Phronesis, and Carteria is not to be taken by storm. And then says Alcibiades, we served together on the expedition to Potidaia. So again, we're transitioning from his military expedition to a real one. And we're again in the most prototypical context for Andrea. Socrates is described as extremely tough. He deals with hunger and thirst. He never gets drunk. He's not thrown off by extreme cold. And then the text continues with the quote on handout uh, 22. Hoi om dal tode rexe kai ekle kartoros aner. 
But what a thing this was that our enduring hero dared to do. This is a quote from the Odyssey. It occurs twice in book four in verse 242 and 271. The first time is when Helen recounts how Odysseus managed to infiltrate Troy and she talked to him. The second time is in the introduction of Menelaus' story of Odysseus and the wooden horse. So here we have yet another comparison of uh, uh, Socrates to a Homeric hero, not this time the mighty Achilles, but the hero with the best mind, Odysseus, where uh, on a military expedition, in both of these stories, Odysseus performs a heroic feat based on sharp mind and smartness. And now we are clearly expecting a martial achievement. But of course, as you are well aware, the story continues as in handout 23. There he was at daybreak with something on his mind, Sinoesas. Not fighting, uh, uh, excuse, excuse me, with something on his mind, uh, standing and reflecting on it. And when he couldn't make progress with it, he didn't give up but stood there looking for a way forward. So again, note the language, standing your ground, not giving up, but now in the context of thinking, not fighting, and not because Socrates wasn't good at the latter. He, he was a good fighter, but this is simply a better goal. Socratic heroism is philosophical thought, philosophy as a way of life. But anchored in the Greek anchor par excellence, Homer, and in the whole Greek tradition of thinking about Andrea, manly courage. So without any reference to the philosophical content, I have explored here how Plato's portrait of Socrates, irrespective of the historical facts on the ground that may have fed into it, manages to simultaneously pr present him as something radically new and vaguely familiar. There's the negative anchor of the sophists, but much more importantly, um, Plato avails himself of positive anchors, some of the strongest cultural markers in Greek society, religion and the Delphic Oracle, the fam familiarity of regular succession between generation and the notion of giving birth, and Homer. So the eternal questioner does so at the orders of the god of Delphi. The knowledge worker without work is not just compared to a midwife, he is also a midwife's son. And for philosophy as a way of life, defining a new ideal of Andrea, Socrates is seen to identify with Achilles in terms of perseverance, standing your ground, sticking to your assigned post in battle, and ignoring all risks apart from that of disgrace and badness. And with the issues he is complain, uh, compared in that perseverance is great. But the most striking achievement on the battlefield may well have been taking the time and dedication to finish a thought. And I think if I may just briefly return to the theory by Tony and Giuliani on Socratic satyr-like uh, portraits, yet another expression of his singularity anchored to the the semi-divine model of atopia, the satyrs, all for apologetic purposes. And, and this is, as I said, true for almost all of Plato's moves. That too would fit in very well with an approach of anchoring innovation. Thank you. All right. Um, Have we stopped sharing? Yeah, the, the screen is no longer shared. The screen is now um, no longer shared. Good. And uh, we move to the question period, discussion period, and uh, we use the raise your hand function, uh, which you can find under reactions. If you have trouble making that work, um, send an email to the Socrates Society and I'll um, or, or, or use the chat. Emily. 
Thank you so much. I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, I just have a very, uh, not, not a very uh, um, interesting comment really um, on your extremely interesting call, uh, talk, but I was thinking um, anchoring seems to me to give more substance to the concept of metaphor. So you've talked about Achilles as, not Achilles, Socrates as, as midwife, as not a sophist, Socrates as, as soldier. Um, so I wondered if you could speak a little bit to this, to um, ways in which the anchoring metaphor, uh, and metaphor again, the concept of anchoring takes us a bit further than, um, than, than the concept of, of metaphor. Yes. Um, it is not, they, the two do not entirely coincide. So first of all, you're quite right. Thank you, Emily, for, uh, for your nice words and for that question. You're quite right that anchoring itself is a metaphor. And we've really been thinking about that because we're using it as an analytical concept. And you have to be aware of the, the baggage, as it were, that it brings, that it brings with it. We chose anchoring because um, it can be active and it can leave unmentioned who does the anchoring. It can be a process and an activity is what I mean. And also because it doesn't condemn us to uh, thinking that this process is always slowing down innovation and that, that it is a break. It can be. People can get too attached to their anchors. And in that case, they're going to be conservative and not like to move forward. But anchoring is also used by mountaineers who clearly want to reach the top of the mountain and want to do so safely and securely by anchoring themselves at every step or every phase. So it is precisely the, the different possibilities that that metaphor offers that uh, made it worthwhile to us. Um, Socrates is really the son of a midwife, I think. There is nothing metaphorical in there. And that is where the anchoring begins because there's a whole tradition of genealogical discourse where there is talk about parents and children, parents being teachers to their children, uh, parents getting jealous of the, what their children do. Um, uh, like I said, the notion that in a well-ordered polis, the children look like their parents. This is also in uh, Hesiod. It's already in Hesiod. Um, if you think about the Kratilus, uh, there is this whole notion that he, he, he uh, discerns an etymological principle, uh, a genealogical principle of etymology, namely that uh, sons should be like their fathers. This is the whole story about Hector and Astyanax. So not everything here is itself a metaphor. He is the son of a midwife. And then he becomes a midwife himself and then redefines that um, as Socrates is, is used, usually does anyway with almost everything to real midwifery, which will involve men and not uh, babies, but thoughts. And that's the and that's a move. You can call that a metaphorical move, but it can also just be seen as an expansion of the original work, the techna of the midwife. So that's one of the things. Um, the Delphi oracle is not a metaphor. It is an oracle. It exists in Greek religion, and it is used here to anchor um, the notion that Socrates has become a searcher. So it's, it's not coextensive. The two things are not coextensive, but it may be the case that uh, an anchor, that you anchor something to something that then itself becomes a metaphor. I agree with that. Were you thinking of anything more particular in the, uh, in the metaphorical arena? Have I missed? No, 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 that was wonderful. Thank you. I was just yes. noticing how this, uh, um, yeah, the anchoring concept seems to have more power to it perhaps than, than what, we've, what we talk about with metaphors. So thank you very much. You're welcome, thank you. Nick Smith. Uh, hi, that was really interesting. Um, uh, my question really has to do with one of the examples and thus may not be uh, quite orthogonal to what you're, uh, what you're doing. 
but it's always struck me the 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 example of Socrates um, claiming to be in the tradition of his mother's um, craft. Uh, his father allegedly was a stonemason. Um, if you wanted to use that as a metaphor for what Socrates did, you might talk about bringing beautiful things out of stone, right? I mean, you you could you could even have a kind of birthing uh, metaphor there, but Socrates pointedly doesn't um, make any association with his father's alleged craft. Maybe there's a problem there, but instead he goes to his mother, which is really striking if you're talking about someone who's supposed to be a paradigm of manliness. Oh, I'm just like my mom. So I wanted to make further comment about that. I love that question. Thank you very much. Um, it reminds me of the role of Diotima, obviously, which is also, you know, uh, here is a woman who's very much portrayed as a, a leading and guiding figure for the young Socrates. And you can wonder why she's a woman, but you may also wonder why it's not a man. And one answer that has been given to that, and I'm very sorry that I can't now footnote it to the right scholar. David Halperin. Um, yeah, is he the one who said, why is she not a man? Okay. Uh, right. Why is she a woman? Yeah. Why, yeah, yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the obverse. Why not a man? Well, a I man think... would be a real problem because basically she's coming up with Plato's theory of forms. So you, it would be very hard to identify another man as the source of that, um, I think, is the answer. I'm not sure it was Halperin, although it's, of course, right up his alley. Um, so here, too, maybe he does something so original and so decidedly uh, appropriates what was traditionally the, the domain of women to make something more valuable out of it. Something, you know, that is now male and that is not, has nothing to do with messy babies, but with austere thoughts that are being uh, born. Uh, that I think here too, it may help to invert the question to say, yeah, why uh, may be more important um, that it's not his father <laughs> that it is his mother. I also always, obviously always think that men are always exploring this one domain where they can't fully get grip um, on what is going on. And it's something very valuable. It's the birth of new life. But this is a solution. Uh, Martha, back. Um, well, the other one, I think, would be Socrates as the doctor, right? The doctor of the soul. So that would be another kind of anchoring. Uh, you've probably already written about that, but um, oh, and he says in the sophist, you know, the noble sophist. Mm -hmm. And another one I thought a negative anchoring is um, he appears to be a sophist, but he's not a sophist. And so there's the appearance of virtue and the real virtue, the appearance of teaching and real teaching, the appearance of speaking on both sides of a question than Phaedrus. Yeah. But, and then he's the dialectician that uses dianoia to lead to noose. And then the sophists are the Akasia guys who hold up a mirror and use their dianoia to create, to get money, power, and all that. So would that be a negative anchoring then? Would you call that? Yeah, I, I think you've just demonstrated that the argument could be expanded. Yes, thank you. Okay. Tom, are you calling? Oops, Diego Garcia. All okay. right. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much for the for the uh, yeah for the talk. And um, so I was wondering about the um, example of Odysseus, uh, yeah. and uh, because I think that uh, there is indeed a very convincing case to be made about the anchoring of Socrates. I mean, he does it himself with Achilles. But uh, so there are some things Socrates says in the Apology that would uh, make one think that he wants to distinguish himself from Odysseus. So 
uh, he is not uh, ready to do and say everything in order to keep on living. So that would be the first thing. And then uh, maybe more importantly, he compares himself to Palamedes and to Ajax, who famously died partly because uh, Odysseus had uh, something uh, to do with that. So uh, um, yeah, I, I, I was just uh, thinking uh, whether you would be uh, uh, um, persistent in uh, this comparison between Socrates and Odysseus, or uh, this could be something uh, less, um, yeah. 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 Thank you very much for this question, because it allows me to add something which I hadn't said before. I did say something about the flexibility of anchors, like you can use the same thing. This is a a famous mythological figure in Homer, uh, and you can use Odysseus and Achilles to, to argue different things. And Plato does that. He does the same thing with Achilles. Remember the Republic. We don't want to be like Achilles and, and abandon ourselves to, to dramatic tears and cry too much and uh, be a victim of our passions. That fits that context. That doesn't mean that in a different context it can be it can be used as a positive anchor. Uh, and for Achilles, I didn't hear you object to that one. But the same thing actually holds for Odysseus. So in the uh, symposium text that I uh, mentioned, clearly uh, a positive uh, martial achievement is being announced, which is anchored to Odysseus. That's the man uh, we were talking about in book four in the Odyssey. And surprisingly, Socrates manages to implement that, that expectation with a, an achievement that we hadn't realized was in this category of ombreia, of manhood. And that doesn't mean that somewhere else, as we all know, Odysseus gets a very different press in different genres and in different specimens of the same genre. So if you look at uh, uh, Odysseus in tragedy, it's really not the same person as in the Odyssey. And uh, uh, Plato has flexibility in his use of that example. But that is what you can do with culturally available paradigms. And it doesn't detract from the fact that here, uh, for the notion of philosophy as a way of life, he has exploited both Achilles elsewhere and in this passage in Symposium, um, Odysseus. So yeah, I'm afraid I'm I'm stubborn on this point, but I give to you that somewhere else there's a critical review of the issues. Chloe? Hi, Chloe. Thank you. Hi, Nikki. So good to see you. Thanks for your talk. Uh, so I put on the chat uh, this reference to Daedalus as an ancestor, but I don't know what really to do out of this, to make out of this, that, but that's another family member, you know, in the Euthyphro passage. Ah, yeah, as yeah, a but, relative. He's an ancestor. He of, mentioned him as an ancestor. Socrates mentions him as, as, as his, his own his ancestor. Own ancestor. Yeah. He does, yeah. But uh, okay, my, one question, I mean, one, one remark, I wanted to see what you think about this. Would you, I mean, I, I think I, I can think of a case of a, of a semi-positive anchoring uh, with Zeno as a, uh, as someone from whom Socrates, when he was very, very young, heard something that could be an, a rehabilitated version of anti-logic that he then uh, can uh, invoke in the Phaedrus. I see. So that would not be really a sophist, but something close, another borderline case that would allow to, uh, Plato to anchor his enterprise to something that's more serious than what see. you see. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. I, I'll take that. I took a note of it. Thank you. Well, um, I have a question while others are thinking. Um, uh, I'd like to ask you to talk a little bit more about Atopia, because it strikes me that uh, just like there's this phenomenon of anchoring there, and you must have thought about this, there's the reverse phenomenon of uh, 
rhetorically emphasizing the strangeness. Um, and so with Atopia, Plato is repeatedly emphasizing that Socrates is not anchored. If you're really Atopos, then there's nothing to anchor you in because you're, uh, you have this Atopia and, uh, well, uh, let me just leave that there for now. Uh, is that a disanchoring move? No, th I think this belongs with my starting point of the, the challenge that Plato was facing. He wants Socrates to be radically new, unique, uh, atopos, daimonios, not quite human, uh, absurd, defying categories. And yet he has to make him somehow recognizable and familiar. So the atopia emphasizes the radical newness and the weirdness. And, uh, and that portrait tradition, actually depicting him as a satyr would reinforce that. Uh, and, and we saw in different texts that that term comes back, right? Atopotatos, atopia, it's a recurring, it's a recurring trope. Uh, and at the same time, there is a, a discourse that makes it possible for people to still think, oh yeah, but he's okay, he's, so he opposes himself to these. And then there's something uh, where we can connect him to American heroes, but then in a different that adaptation of something, that's good. And that's the anchoring part of it. There's always the doubleness. So you want it to be new and you want it to be familiar. So, so the atopia hit Plato's drive to, to portray Socrates as atopos helps um, uh, generate the need for these anchoring devices. Yes. Rhetorically. I was, I was uh, trying to think by comparison to, to Xenophon for whom Socrates is not so strange. Yeah. Um, uh, people uh, uh, have criticized, people who criticize Xenophon always talk about Xenophon Socrates being um, uh, conventional. And I think he's got moral principles that are quite different uh, from uh, standard Athenian values. But instead of creating the tension, Xenophon does, um, uh, rhetorically reduce the strangeness. Um, and so that's, that's the way he handles it, which is quite a different way from, from Plato, who you know, creates this tension and maintains it. Right. Yeah, nice. That's a nice observation. Emily again? Yeah, just to add on to your point there, Donald, I was thinking, yeah, usually there's this more conventional Socrates and Xenophon, um, but he does at some points like with the idea of Socrates as matchmaker. I think just very selectively, you find something quite similar. And I think there are affinities in some of the ways, some of what Inika was speaking about. Uh, he uses some of those anchoring devices, um, but absolutely in the context of um, only very selective emphasis on atopia, I think I would argue. Nice, very nice, thank you. Well, in that case, let's, let's thank Inika for a very stimulating uh, original talk that uh, sets our minds going. And uh, uh, I hope to see all of you again in two weeks. I'll, I'll, I'll applaud on behalf of all thank, of you. Thank you, Don. Thank you all. It was lucky to see you. I briefly saw Richard Bett. Also great, great to see you here, uh, Richard. Very nice. Thank you for having me here. All right. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.